Uh, good afternoon, my name is Dr. Amanda Irvin, and I'm an Associate Director at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And it is my distinct honor and privilege today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jose Antonio Bowen. Dr. Bowen is president of Goucher College in Maryland. He's won teaching awards at Stanford, Georgetown, Miami, and Southern Methodist University, where he was dean of the Meadows School for the Arts for eight years. He was the founding director of the Center for the History and Analysis of Recorded Music at the University of Southampton in England. He's written over 100 scholarly articles, edited the Cambridge Companion to Conducting, and received a national endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. He has appeared in Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the United States with Stan Getz, Dizzy Gillespie, Bobby McFerrin, Dave Brubrick, Liberace, and many others. He served on the editorial board for Jazz Research Journal, the Journal of the Society for American Music, and the Journal of Music History Pedagogy. He's also a founding board member of the National Recording Pre Preservation Board for the Library of Congress and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in England. Dr. Bowen has been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and on NPR for his book, Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of Your Classroom Will Improve Student Learning, which won the Ness Award for Best Book on Higher Education from the American Association of Colleges and Universities. He's recently released Teaching Naked Techniques, a practical guide to designing better classes, which he co-authored with Edward Watson. Teaching Naked Techniques, or TNT, because it's dynamite, builds on the science of teaching and learning and offers practical strategies for edu educators wishing to innovate and maximize student learning. We are delighted to have Dr. Bowen with us today for the 2017 Celebration of Teaching and Learning Symposium. Won't you all please join me in welcoming him to Columbia University. Thank you. Thanks, Clicker. Yes. Great. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, being interested in teaching uh, on an afternoon like today. Uh, so, you can see some things on the screen. If you don't know what that means, you need an eight-year-old to help you fast. And if you want a live tweet, that's okay too. Um, I want to start by impressing upon you three key notions um, that relate to what I'm going to talk about today and also to what you do. Uh, the first is that you are expensive. Uh, and that's okay because, if you, and because you're also the most important thing on campus. And if that wasn't the case, we would simply outsource you, which would be bad, right? Um, so when you ask students what matters most in college, when you ask them a year later, five years later, Ken Baines has done this 40 years after they graduated from Harvard, you say, what were the things that really mattered to you? Nobody ever says courses, classes, credits, or even topics, usually. It's people. It's Professor X, Professor Y, the chance to watch Professor Jones think, the chance to be in this research lab, the, the office hours with so-and-so, that, that students talk mostly about relationships with people, with you. So the, on the one hand, your interactions with students are the most expensive, your face-to-face -face interactions, right? Putting all your lectures online would be a whole lot cheaper, but it doesn't have the same impact. Right, that, that it's the it's the face-to-face -face interaction. It can be in small groups, it can be individually, but that's really what matters. I sometimes call this the new three R's. The new three R's are what really makes a difference in higher education: relationships, resilience, and reflection. If you can teach students those three things, the rest they can learn from the internet. Right? And it really is true. The internet is this great resource, as I'll come and talk about. Um, but it's not as easy as it sounds to just learn things because you have to know what's real. The second point I want to make today is that technology is not a strategy, right? Chalk is a technology, right? So if you wanted to increase the amount of chalk on campus, that would sound pretty stupid, right? Because you would have more chalk, right? But what you want is more learning. Now, in order to have more learning, you might need more chalk if you're out of chalk. Right? But, so you might need some computers and you might need technology, but the real goal is to increase student learning. So the question with technology is not do we need more of it. 
The question is, where does it go? When do you use it? When is the most efficient time for technology? Should students be using it in or outside of the classroom? Should they have their laptops open when they're taking notes? No. Should they have, should they have their laptops closed? Yes. But that's like asking them to take off a finger, so it's a trick. All right, so we'll come back to that. The third point is that learning is fundamentally about change, that your value is not fundamentally as a content provider, right? That what you do in the classroom is help students learn for themselves. That it's about change, because otherwise it's just memorization. It's what they did in high school. It's learning a bunch of lists. Real learning occurs when you say, you know, that's interesting, but I have to change what I thought I already knew. That that's not just a new fact to add to my list, but that new information, that new content, that new way of thinking changes what I thought I already knew. And so I have to reevaluate. So that's that reflection part of the three R's, right? Relationships, resilience, try again, failure is important, and reflection. Because without reflection, you're just like your phone, right? We're so, we're so confused about what it means to be smart. We think, well, smart is the person who knows the most. We're so confused, we actually call it a smartphone. But your phone isn't smart, is it? Right? It's not about who knows the most. It's smart people are smart because they can change his or her mind. Right? The ability to change your mind that makes you smart. And that's really what we do here. We teach students how to change their mind, how to assess evidence, how to come to conclusions for themselves. So I think of this often as, as something that's been changed by technology. Right? Our relationship to knowledge has fundamentally been changed by our relationship, uh, by, by technology. So when I went to college, right, and you wanted to know something, you had to go to this crazy thing called an encyclopedia. Remember those? Books, right, 36 volumes in the library, right? So it was a relatively scarce resource, right? You didn't have one at home, most of us. I did not have one of those at home, right? I didn't have any of them. So we gave them students' textbooks and encyclopedia, lots of books in the library, and we taught them how to, a bibliography course, how to find them, right? Because if you found the book, it had been published. There were standards. It was relatively reliable. So knowledge in the old days was relatively scarce, but relatively reliable, right? Not every encyclopedia article was good, and not every textbook was correct. But there were no jokes. There were no cat videos in the encyclopedia. There was no satire in the encyclopedia. Right? So contrast that with the way it is today. Today, students arrive on campus with a device that has access to all of those wonderful TED Talks and Columbia University MOOCs and all of this wonderful content. The Library of Congress is there, the Congressional Record, all the Beethoven manuscripts. Right? I was, I'm a music, right, music student, and so I always wanted to see the Beethoven manuscripts as well. You know, in order to see Beethoven manuscripts, you're going to have to write a couple of letters to people in government in Germany. Then you have to get, apply for a grant and get a plane ticket, and you're going to have to fly there. And then you put on the white gloves, and then you sit in the basement. And then if you want to turn the page, they'll ring the, ring the bell, and somebody will come and turn the page for you. And then ring the bell again in an hour, right? I mean, and now you just say, Siri, I'd like to see Beethoven's manuscripts. But the problem is that your phone is mostly full of cat videos. Right? It's mostly full of content that's garbage. You know, some guy in Bob, in his underwear named Bob in Idaho, is trying to like, you know, fill the internet with content, apparently. Um, and it, so I used to actually have a whole rap that I would do about satire on the internet. Right? Hopefully you recognize this news story as satire. It's a few years out of date, but right. This was the Michigan football coach was given a $52 million contract, and so somebody said, hey, wouldn't it be funny if that were actually a faculty member? Joke's on us, I guess, right? Sorry. <laughs> but the irony is that I, I no longer have to actually make this point about what students think is real because the president's doing it for us. And so, I mean, right? Could, is there, has there ever been a clearer time when, the, when the, the fact that somebody says something is true on the internet or on Twitter does not make it true? Right? This is an essential problem of democracy, and so that is, I think, always been the case, and technology has done this, but I don't think I have to belabor the point that, in fact, our relationship to knowledge has changed, and that students have access, but access to content is not the same thing as being able to tell what's real, what's useful. Right? So think about this. If your title is professor, sorry, but the value of professing has dropped precipitously, but the good news is, 
you don't primarily teach content. You do, but you mostly teach critical thinking, analysis, and discernment, all of which have gone up in value. Right? The things that we really like to teach most, how to help students learn how to think for themselves, has increased in value in the same proportion that professing content has gone down in value. So think about this. Is, is more content always a good thing? Is more exercise equipment always a good thing? Right? Is more always better? So think about if I said, I'm going to give you an exercise bike for every room in your house, two in the kitchen, three in the bathroom. Am I helping? Right? I could fill up your house, right? So access to exercise equipment doesn't necessarily mean you get on it. So there's a role for somebody called a fitness coach. Somebody who knows about exercise equipment, knows about the body, but mostly knows about you. Right? So what does a fitness coach really do? First thing fitness coach, right? It's like, ah, get on the bike. Is that really what a fitness coach does? I mean, partly, it's true, but that's the trivial part. The non-trivial part is, tell me about what you want to get out of this. Why, why are you here, right? Oh, you want to wear that dress for the prom? Pedal faster. That connection between what matters to the student and what matters to you is non-trivial. In fact, that's the es essence of teaching. Teaching always begins with what matters to your students. It ends with what matters to you. You want to pull them in, but you've got to, but the place that you add value is that I have content, listen to me. Well, the TED Talks and the internet are full of that content, but they can't get on the internet as someone who says, let me understand about you and what motivates you and why you're here. So I would say that professor is an outdated title. You should all be called cognitive coaches. Students are actually here to watch you think, and that's a good thing. So relationship to knowledge has changed. I think we have to change in response to that. The second big change in technology also, I, don't, I used to have to talk about this, and now I don't, I don't have to belabor this anymore either, is, is social proximity. The, the meaning of friends has ultimately changed forever, right? And stu your students, by the way, are no longer millennials. Your freshmen and sophomores are now Gen Z, um, right? They have always had a device. They are going to bring their high school friends with them to college, right? Because they're on Facebook, they're on their phone, they're gonna talk to them every day. So the, the need for making new friends, meeting new people with different ideas, has actually changed because I have all these friends with me, right? It also means that my need to seek you out or my desire, my fear level of seeking you out in your office hours has gone down a little bit, right? And don't forget, your office, that's like the inner circle of hell. First of all, you were there, right? You have degrees I've never even heard of. You're like, books, and I'm allergic to books, and that's all in your office, and right, I can never, you're never there when I'm there anyway, right, and it's like, because I was there on Tuesday at one o'clock, and you weren't there, so you must never be there, right, and that's true, but think about it, is your bank always open? Well, not physically, but if you're still going to the bank physically, right, you're a little out of touch, right, I haven't been, I actually moved, when I moved to Maryland three years ago, Chase Bank, they don't have any of them in Maryland. There's no, there's no Chase Banks in Maryland. I thought, well, I need to get a new bank. And they said, no, you don't. Why would you have to go to a bank? So I haven't been to a bank in three years. Why would I? I can use my phone to deposit checks, right? I mean, I don't need cash that much. I mean, so, right, that, and if the banking goes down on a Sunday night, when I'm doing my, my, my bank account, right, and the website goes down, am I happy? I expect my bank to be available 24-7, right? So, those assumptions that students bring are just different, right? They are entirely different from what they used to be. And if you doubt me, ask a student about dating. Remember dating? Just, if you have a strong, ask a student about how dating works and, you know, one swipe will change your life and all of that, um, right? The assumptions about whether you're gonna meet somebody face to face are different, right? Um, students will tell me that their first impressions, right? They're gonna meet their, their spouse, their college roommate, the, the in-laws, the future employers, they'll probably meet online first. Once they've established a relationship, or if they've done a little research online, right? And think about this, my daughter says, but dad, you told me never to go to an interview without doing your homework. You told me to always Google the person I'm gonna interview with before I go. So I never walk into the room and have a first impression. I've had a first impression online. This is the second impression. It's a face-to-face -face impression. Same is true of you. If you're not online, it's like, are you some sort of predator? Do you have a problem, right? Where, where are you? Just, you don't exist online? Where, where are you, right? So, and, and a student literally said to me, you know, I'll probably never meet my best friend. And I said, what the heck is, I don't know, what's that about? I said, well, you know, because we've been playing video games. He lives in Germany. I've known him since I was five. We talk every day. 
That seems weird to me. It no longer seems weird to have a best friend that you've never met. So my point is that if you want to get students into your office, you probably need to have some online presence too. You need to be a little less scary than just being in your office. And so I'm not suggesting that we have to live online with our students, but it's a useful tool to convince them that maybe I'm safe in coming in to see me face to face. Again, it doesn't start with what, you know, it starts with what matters to your students. So if they're a little afraid, so tease them out here, respond to their text or their email, get them to come into your office. Uh, my favorite technique for this actually is to have a, a Facebook group or a Twitter feed for your course, right? Hashtags are easy to create. And then when a student s sends you a, an email, right? Would you like to have less email? Here's a way to have less email. When a student sends you email, just, t just have the formal response, copy and paste. That's a great question. Others probably have it too. Please post it online in the Facebook group or your, your Canvas site or if you have a course website of some sort so that everybody can see it. And then you can get used to responding in that public form where people can see it. Students will, will send you less email. Sometimes I, I let them, I use chat as a kind of triage for this, but I, but I don't answer the questions unless it's, you know, a personal problem where, you know, my grandma died and I have to, yeah, that I do in private. But for most questions about course content, I say just put that on the, on the Facebook group site and then, then some magic happens. I go to sleep. Because I go to sleep at a normal time and so at three in the morning it's like, oh my God, what's the assignment due tomorrow? Was it due tomorrow? Was it due tomorrow? And other students will actually respond. So in the morning I check it, make sure no, no idiocy happened while I was sleeping. Um, but that takes me only a couple of minutes and students actually get used to doing exactly what we used to want them to do. Form a community of scholars where they're talking about Plato outside of classroom. But they're not doing it in the dining hall anymore because, of course, they, they don't want to eat in the dining hall. They want to grab and go and take their sushi with them back to their room where they open up their laptop. So you can get them to form a community, but actually they form online communities. So that's one of the, the techniques that I suggest. Um, people say to me, what's the strangest thing you learned as a college president? You say, well, I'm sure you have this at Columbia, but we have a plumber. We have a full-time job for a plumber who really just gets toilets out of self, out of, uh, cell phones out of toilets. That's actually a job at college now, right? And, but that's not actually the strangest thing I learned as a college president. I mean, students, that, right, they, they can't, they, they drop their phone in the toilet a lot. The weird thing is, they want it back. <laughs> right, my daughter says to me, Dad, look at my new waterproof case for my phone. And I think, are you learning how to scuba dive? Why do you need a waterproof case for your phone? And, of course, the reason is on Facebook because they, right? And so, in fact, the other thing I learned is that um, if you look at this data, this is a couple years old, so this has probably changed, but in 2014, the number of students who said, I always use a phone when I go to the restroom, 30%. 30% of students cannot use the bathroom without a phone in their hand. So rule number two, never ask a student to borrow their phone. <laughs> All right. So, Technology has changed our relationship to knowledge, it's changed the whole meaning of friends and social proximity, but it's had a third profound change on our students. The idea of customization in gaming has entered their lives from the time they were very little. So you and I remember the days when it was like, have it your way was actually a slogan to distinguish a particular burger chain, right? Have it your way is now the mantra of an entire generation, right? And they have grown up with this. Think about this, that video games, are able, are a great learning environment. They're able to actually modify what they do for everybody instantly. So if you were all learning uh, from physics or tennis or something from me in here, I would be teaching one thing and you're like a little bored because I'm not going fast enough and you're out of touch because it's like he's going too fast, slow down, right? So you, good teachers teach to the middle, right? You try to kind of watch the body language, see where people are. A video game doesn't work that way. You're on level one because you need a little help. You're on level 30 because you're doing better. You're on level 3,000 because you've done this before. And so, right, the video game can do that instantly. You're all on different levels. You're doing it in Arabic. You're doing it in Chinese. You're doing it in French. Most of us can only speak one language at a time. But the internet can speak all languages simultaneously. Right, video games adjust to your level. They call this pleasantly frustrating. A good video game works because it's pleasantly frustrating. It's not too easy, not too hard. Because what happens if something is too easy? You quit. What happens if something is too hard? 
you quit. So what you want is pleasantly frustrating. You want to be challenged just enough and engaged to keep you going. The problem is that what's challenging and pleasantly frustrating for you may not be for the person next to you. So you and I, when we went to school, we got used to the fact that, okay, I'm not pleasantly frustrated right now because she's going over that again for, for Dodo in the corner, or, oh my God, it's too fast, I've got to catch up. And that was just part of the give and take. But students now have spent more time playing video games in their life. At, by the time they're 18, they come to you, they spent more hours playing video games than they have in class. On average, the 18-year-old in America spent 10,000 hours playing video games by the time they come to college. 10,000 hours. So you can not like what video games are doing, but it turns out video games are great learning environments. Right? You may not like what they're teaching, but they're great learning environments because I'm engaged and I'm learning and I'm processing and video games are really just a series of little tests, right? Micro tests. And when I get good at something and I do well, I get to a new level and then it gets a little harder. The challenge can, right? Video games are actually set up like an ideal classroom where every student is in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the environment. That's great. Then they come to us. So again, how do we make college more like a great video game? And what that means is not that we need to have more technology, but we need to figure out ways to engage everybody in a pleasantly frustrating way. But that's the secret. Engagement comes before learning. It's not, let me tell you some things you know, but how do I get you interested and engaged? Because once I've done that, then the learning can happen. Right, so those are three pretty big changes. So um, I, just a couple of little examples I want to show you about um, the way this works. So the first is that your students are doing something that you may not be aware of. Well, maybe you are. But when a student g goes, right, when you put on your syllabus, right, Econ 101, I'm going to talk about, you know, international markets on Tuesday morning, and it's snowing outside, right? First of all, remember students sleep with their laptops. Sorry, it's in the bed. It's actually in the bed there. So you open up the laptop or the iPad, and again, that data I showed you, right, the first thing that students touch in the morning and the last thing they touch at night is not each other. It's a cell phone. 60%. It's the first thing they do every morning, touch a cell phone, right? So they're going to check and say, well, wait, is your talk online? is a talk similar to. So if you're just delivering lectures, the first thing I'm going to do is, is there a talk online? And the second thing I'm going to do is say, well, okay, um, is, there a, is there a talk that's shorter? Right? So, um, so you're looking, um, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, feminism. And so I've given people, um, uh, so I don't want that one. It's, see, this is the problem with Google. It kind of knows what you're looking for, right? Um, so I want to actually show you the process. Okay, so, so this is what you would do. So if, I, if I, you put feminist theory on the syllabus, your students are going to put in feminist theory and they're going to Google it, right? Um, of course, theory is kind of a big, you know, $40 word, so they might just put feminism explained, right? But again, this is what you would get, right? Because you did a regular search. That's what I would do. See this little button here? More settings, see that? Um, hang on, tools. Ooh, look, interesting. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit videos, right? And then I'm gonna add duration, short, <laughs> right? I'm not looking for a 15 minute lecture. I wanna know, is there a Cliff Notes version of this that actually lasts four minutes? So in fact, students are looking for shortcuts and don't blame them, it's not a bad thing. You do shortcuts, right? When the provost sends you a 36 page email and there's an executive summary, you read the executive summary and say, I don't need to read the whole thing, I got it, right? You're looking for a shortcut. So you wanna know what this is because the first hit here. Hi, I'm a feminist. Oh no, why? I want to get equal rights for women. You must be pleased with your success. No. Why not? The patriarchy. The patriarchy? It means men control everything and we need feminists to fight more than ever. How can that be when women are the majority of voters in every election? A lot of women voters are worthless. So here's the problem. The problem is that you and I recognize satire almost immediately. But if you scroll down and watch the notes, the people here that are watching this don't have it. This is not, this is not satire, right? This is the, right, they, so, right, that, that 500,000 views. So this is what students have actually understood before they come into your feminist 
you know, lit, crit, whatever course, they've probably not done the reading, they've looked for a video. Um, so my point is not that this is a good thing, but that you can use this to teach them what's really important. So you can either just acknowledge and just recognize they're going to do this, or you can say, you know what, here's a great video on, on you know, whatever. Um, watch the video, find three mistakes. Was this satire? Do you think this is real? Is it credible? How would you know? How would you know this is real knowledge? Write it on an index card, bring it to class. One paragraph, again, I, I do lots of writing. It's low tech. Index cards are cheap. Write why you think this is real or important. Bring it to class. First thing I do is pass it to your neighbor. Turn it over, write a rebuttal. Right? That they, there's, there's some dialogue. There's what's the different opinion. How would this work? Put your name on it. I can now take attendance if I want to. Those sorts of things. So some of these videos are great. Right? Students have, by the way, all used the Khan Academy by the time they get to you. Right? This is the most trafficked educational site on the planet. Um, you know, a few million dollars from Bill Gates doesn't hurt. But, but they've all experienced this sort of short and turn into notice it's, it's, us. it's if, short if it's is, nine minutes let's, let's it's say not a 50 this minute was lecture the, the sperm from my father that fuses with right so but this idea of you know the short video and again he didn't call them lectures and talks but he calls them playlists right it's just a language thing um, but it's not unlike the, the gaming thing right i mean their students no understand the, the language so students get all tense when you tell them there's a midterm and there's a final exam and, right so there's actually a professor who's gamified his whole course uh, in the midwest and so he just says okay so in this course there're going to be seven quests there's a mid quest and there's a final quest a couple of optional quests and I'd like you to take some quests, right? I mean, it's, it's just language, but if it right, de-stresses students. So they're used to playlists from the Khan Academy. Um, they've probably used PHET from the University of Colorado, right? Thousands of science and math simulations, um, great ways to learn things. Members of the internet can speak multiple languages at once. Well, right, if you might have a few students who find your discussion of Hegel in English difficult, um, but because Spanish is their native language. Well, there's actually plenty of content in other languages, right, if you want to, so, so students are going to look for this. They're going to look for Chinese or Arabic or Spanish language sites that have short summaries of your content. And I would argue it's not a bad thing. Um, this, for example, is another, this is called Crash Course. This is a very, very popular, highly funded, uh, again, from the Gates Foundation, um, simplest app, one that just sends out a little ping, always at the same volume and length, to communicate everything. By the way, they're also closed captions, so they're ADA compliant, unlike Juro yours. To, boy, I sure right. would like to breathe sometime soon. Well, that is actually exactly how your neurons send all the impulses responsible for every one of your actions, thoughts, and emotions. So, when a neuron is stimulated okay. enough, it fires an electrical impulse that zips down its axon to it. So unlike the other video, this one's not so bad, right? I mean, he talks too fast, but he's young, and it's got animation, right? He looks, you know, like he knows what he's talking about. Um, and of course, most importantly, he has, you know, wood paneling in the background, so that must be, right? I mean, right, so there's, so students are gonna accept this as more reliable, in this case, they're actually, they're actually right. Um, but there's all sorts of things. There's basically a song for everything. Right. is it just fantasy? Caught in the landscape, out of touch with reality. Compactify, on S5 or T star S3. Space is a pure void, why should it be stringy? Cause it's quantum cause, classical. So you're wondering, where, where are the students in my string theory course? Um, I want you to look at that number on the bottom underneath the video, right? See that 2,900,000 views? That's why they're not in your physics course, right? Because this is a little bit more fun. Um, by the way, this is an MIT uh, graduate student. He's actually singing all the parts. So if you find that your graduate students are posting this stuff online, they have way too much time on their hands. Um, so do something about this. So, so one way to use online content is to either just let students find it on their, on the, on their own, and then, right, then you get to see what they're actually looking at, right? The cliff notes, one of my favorite assignments is, okay, right? So how many of you actually read Hamlet? Oh, good, okay. So how many of you actually watched the, the Hamlet cliff notes video? It's like, okay, maybe a little bit. So fine, I know they're gonna do this. So, 
take an index card. When you watch the video, there's little yellow things that come up. What are the themes of the play? They pop up so you know what the themes are. List a theme that Cliff Notes forgot and tell me why it's an important theme in Hamlet. So, I mean, they're just going to go to another website and look for another, right? They're going to look for themes. Of, they're going to Google. But at least you've implanted the idea that maybe the Cliff Notes should not be their only source, right? And then they go to, right, they're, they're, they're thinking about this. And then, of course, if I really want them to read the play or go see it, I've got to convince them that reading is a different skill, right? That, that, so I'm going to have you read the novel. Okay, maybe the first chapter you can check the cliff notes. I want you to actually read chapter two and then write your favorite quote. What, what line actually gives you insight into the character? Put it on an index card, tell me why, bring it to class, right? Lots of writing, lots of explaining, lots of index cards. But it also turns out that students are looking for alternative explanations, partly because, right, remember you're teaching to the middle. You're not a video game. You're, you're not able to, te to give millions of examples all at once. So you can give one example at a time, right? And of course, all of us have had that, oh my god, I've got 12 more great examples, but I'm out of time, right? In a podcast, this never happens. So I used to do this in my jazz course. I would teach the blues like this. Something different happens every course. So here's a 12-bar blues. I'll count it for you. Two, three, four. Let's count base. Five, six, seven, Thank you. Thank you. eight. Nine, I count. Ten, eleven, twelve. New chorus. One. So that's called a twelve-bar blues. Three. Right. So some of you are four. going, okay, easy. I played the trumpet in high school. Got it. Others of you are going, what? So in class, what I would do is I'd look around and say, who's got it? Okay, let me do a few more examples and see what happens. The problem is you may not get it, not because you don't understand music, but because you just hate the example I just gave, right? You just, you're, just, you're so turned off by that example. So it's like, okay, here's another example. Um, here's, ah, hang on, I think I clicked the wrong thing. Here we are. Um, yeah. Go. So where else in American pop music do you think we'll find the blues? Well, how about bluegrass? Same content. Different type of example. It's a 12 bar blues. Five. I'm counting. I just changed the example. I'm talking bluegrass instead of nine. Count basic. So some people are going, oh, new chorus. I'm kind of like, I'm ready. I'm having a good time. I'm, right, I'm engaged first. Other people are going, you must be joking. Right? So it's like, okay, I got more examples. Right? You didn't like, you, you can't relate, you can't learn that concept with bluegrass. How about Here's James, James Brown, Brown singing the blues? Same concept, right? So in a podcast, Second and break. notice I have these chapters. This is part of what to me is the secret, right? Is that I list the chapters. So I say, here, I'm going to teach you how to do a 12-bar blues. In class, I might do three or four examples. But I can give you a podcast with 40, 50, 100 examples. Pick the ones that are relevant to you. Think about when you explain any concept, right? You explain it using analogies that make sense to you. So I use soccer analogies. And the students are like, you know, we're Americans. We don't understand soccer. Give us some baseball analogies. And it's like, I don't know baseball, so I can't do that. But even if I could, the minute I start doing baseball analogies, my soccer kids are, wait, oh, I, know we, right, I can't go back. Oh, no, you want gardening examples. OK, you want fashion examples, right? I can't do it all at once. Actually, you can. You can do it on a podcast where you say, here's the concept. I'm going to explain thermodynamics today. Here's a soccer analogy, here's a baseball analogy, here's a fashion example, here's a gardening, here's a cook, right? I can give hundreds, here's an example for a law student, an example for engineering, right? I can give lots of different ways of understanding it simultaneously using this, this format. Or a talking PowerPoint does the same thing, put it on a website. The other, the other thing that's interesting about you delivering content online, I could do one in French, I could do, right? I could do one in another language. You could outsource this to your students. So one of my favorite um, assignments is Explain this concept to your roommate. So this is a math assignment. This is explain functions and how they work to your roommate. So every student, like all 30 students are going to do this, right? Here's one of the examples. This is the explaining functions to his roommate. Fraction, and this is the Joe Fraction Show. On this episode, we'll be covering functions. A function is a special relationship between two values where each input has exactly one output. A good application of functions is looking at the relationship between level of skill with an instrument and the level of chicks that you can get. See, try this. As 
his skill level is one, he gets one check. One to one. Okay. Hey, Billy, how's that bass playing going? I'm having a little trouble here, Joe. Oh, I'm not quite getting it. Oh, not to fear. With the bass function, there's a white intercept. So with zero skill level, you get two bays. Right, because he's got the bass backwards. He actually can't make Functions. any noise, but... The guitar function here has a higher slope. Higher so slope. So with a little amount of skill, you get a lot of girls. So, apologies for the sexist example. That's a different discussion. Piano, on the other hand, is a negative slope, so you end up getting negative chicks. Sorry. All right. So... But the point is, remember, the assignment was not just another problem set. Can you make a two-minute video explaining the concept to your roommate? So that, 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 that requires a couple things that we know work, right? Abstracting the concept. This is really good for learning, right? Having to reinterpret the concept in another context. Metaphors, analogies. All of that is great learning. So, yeah, I'm willing to forgive him the, the, the sexist um, example because I actually think he understands and because his roommate will now understand Right? So in fact, what you can do then is collect all of these. Two or three a year will be really good. So next year, what do I do? I add two or three examples to my blues thing. Right? I can add, give me your best example of the blues from pop music, because I've never heard of whatever artist you're just, right? I'll add them to my, so now my list of examples gets longer, and students have more choice in terms of figuring out how can I understand functions. So this is a way you can outsource that. Um, you can make uh, that happen. All right. So, where did I put this? Got it. All right. So, I talked about podcasts and about, again, so my idea is that you use the internet for some first exposure. Um, and again, students actually use online content. And what they want is they want you to help them know which content is better. Right? So, this, is, this data is normally interpreted as well. Tell them which video to watch. And I actually think that's the mistake. I'm actually opposed to textbooks. Because when in life is someone going to give you, well, here's the, here's the information you can trust, right? In fact, that's what our president's trying to do right now. I'm the information you can trust. Don't trust anybody else. If I said it, it's true, right? That's what a textbook is like. So I would say, look, the world is messy. There's no textbook for this course. The internet is out there. There's some good information out there. You have to find it, though. And in order to get there, you're going to have to weed through a lot of crap. But your ability to weed through crap is actually the most important part of this. So I actually think you should make it messier. My next book is going to be Noisy and Messy Classrooms, because I think we make it too neat, and I've been very guilty of that. Um, so a couple things you could do with social proximity as well, because I mentioned that. So how can you use this new tool, right? So my first suggestion is that you no longer make announcements in class. You're, right, you're there in class. Students have had to come to class, take the subway, park, right, air conditioning, heat, whatever. All of this is expensive. So when you make announcements, it's like when you summarize the reading, right? Then why my, a smart kid goes, hey, this professor is going to summarize the reading. So if I don't do it, it's okay, right? So what you should do is simply not play that game with them. So when they say, when's the midterm? Is the midterm in change? What's, fine, just I'll put, it on, I'll put it on Facebook. I'll put it on the course website. I'll put it on Canvas. That's where the announcements are going to be. I have, I'm too busy here. There's too much really important stuff to do face to face to waste a second of it doing announcements. Research is pretty emphatic that we know that students learn more. They actually learn more when they believe that you care about their learning. Notice I didn't say you had to actually care. It's a perception, but I mean, you do care, and that's a good thing, but students actually learn more when they perceive that you care about their learning and you care about your subject, right? So you've been handed this great tool, all the social media is a way to say, hey, this exciting thing, a tsunami just happened in Japan, right? You're in my earthquakes course. Any connection, right? I mean, this is a chance to connect with your students, to show that you care about them. You, by the way, are weird. You are a bad model for how college should work. You like school so much you're still here. That's not normal. Most, most students, undergraduates, want to graduate and leave and not come back. That's normal. It's not a bad thing. It's just normal, right? So you learned in spite of all the weird stuff that happened. You learned the system. You're good at the system. So when you got stuck on problem number six, you probably figured out you could go on to number seven. 
I, as a first-generation student, was not one of those kids. So my mother, who had a second-grade education, said to me, you do them all, every week, every problem, in order. That was the advice she gave me when I went to college. So what happened when I got stuck on problem number six on a Sunday? I stayed on problem number six, and I never got to problem number seven, because she told me I had to do them in order, right? She didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I wasn't going to go ask the professor and get in trouble. So if you had tweeted me on a Sunday afternoon, hey, problem number six is hard. If you're stuck, skip it. You would have changed my life. So most of these techniques will have a disproportionate impact on first-generation students who don't know the rules. You were good at understanding the rules. Why are we reading Foucault? This is ridiculous. I quit. You were not the ones who quit. You're the ones who said, wow, this is cool. I want to read some more. You're weird. Right? So that little text on Sunday, hey, I know Foucault is hard. Chapter one is really a bitch. But hey, it gets better in chapter number two. Just kidding. Right? You should, you should make sure they know you're kidding. But, but the point is that little bit of encouragement, the passion, has, we can measure its effect on student learning. You've also been given the perfect tool for making connections. We often complain students are too insular. Well, they, you know, they think what happens in class stays there. It's like it's Las Vegas, right? What happens in class stays here. Well, that's your fault, right? You could help them make connections. So my favorite assignment is a Twitter assignment. Here's the hashtag for my course, right? Every week or every day, I know people who do this five times a day. I think that's obsessive. But you could do it once a day or once a week. I want you to tweet something that you found in the world that relates to this week's topic. I don't care what it is. But what I want you to do is to look in the world for things that relate to our topic, right? This is easy to find. It's no privacy problems, right? It's just a, you're going to use a hashtag. It's not infectious, right? Students will then tweet with this hashtag. And then you have a list of stuff. Wow, here are the connections the student make. So I had a student, and we were talking about um, mindfulness or reflection or something. And, and the student posted a Seinfeld video. And I thought, oh, right. It's just the Seinfeld. And I watched the clip. It's like a 27 clip. It's like, bingo, that's the best example I've ever seen. The kid actually processes in Seinfeld, which is weird. But like the video, I learned something about how my students are processing, and that's useful. But it was more useful for the student to have to make those analogies and to make that connection. Right? So introduce readings. Right? Sunday afternoon is a great time to do this. You don't want to do this. You can actually preset it on Friday. I use Hootsuite. Right? There are lots of these tools. So you can time your tweet and your Facebook post so that you can be sleeping. But students want it on Sunday afternoon or Sunday night. Hey, we're meeting on Monday. Just a reminder, Foucault is really important. Really try. It's only 15 pages. Right? Here's what to look for. That advice doesn't belong in your syllabus, which is under the bed by now, eaten by the rodents. They don't know. Right? So what I wanted is a little reminder, a little bit of incentive to introduce the readings at that last moment. Um, Building community, right? I told you about Facebook. I want students to talk to each other electronically, even if they won't talk to each other face to face. And I, I did the start of this in the early 90s. So this is really the beginning. We ran a study of students who were discussing things in class, and we added an email. It was an email list at that point. And we found that some students were too shy to speak in class, or they, they were just they wanted to think a little bit more, they wanted to do some research. So different students posted online then spoke up in class. It wasn't the same group of students. Right? So this is a chance to get students to talk to each other. It's an addition. It's not a substitute for the face-to-face, -face, but it actually does work. And my favorite is that you, we all live in a really fast world where we're constantly saying, hey, you just won the Super Bowl. What do you think? And nobody ever says, you know, my amygdala, it's overactive right now. I probably shouldn't answer that question. I'm, too, I'm really excited, but I don't have words. Right? They, they give you some stupid answer. Right? Students may never have seen an adult change her mind in front of them. Think parents, preacher, president, right? The idea that you're going to say, you know what? That's interesting. You've asked me an interesting question. I'm going to think about it some more, and I will post something later. I'll, I'll answer that in email later. Because what you're proving, even if you know the answer, why? Right? Because what you're, sh what you're demonstrating is that smart people are thoughtful. Smart people slow down to consider, to find more information. That's what smart is, and they know that you're smart. They know that. They're watching you think. So don't always give them the answer. Use social media as a way to say, I'm going to think about this. I'll email you later because I, I, I really want to think about your question. It's a good question. We'll see you tomorrow, but I want to, right? That's, a, that's just modeling what smart people do, and it's a great way to use social media because otherwise, it's like, well, I'm not going to see you until the midterm, so I'll have to tell you then. But this is a better way. And then I also suggest virtual office hours. 
not as a replacement, but just some online presence to say, hey, because think about this. I know you were weird, but most people are studying for your Wednesday test Tuesday night. So when do they want help? Tuesday night, 11 o'clock. You're sleeping, I know. But try this. I'm going to be online. I'm going to be on Facebook to answer questions from 9 to 10 on Tuesday. If you have questions, post them. I'll try to answer. Right? Try that as an office hour. You will be surprised at what you get. This, by the way, is the current use of academic devices. You know, laptops you're not surprised by. But look at the increase in smartphones. Right? This is as the primary academic device. That's why they're not reading Foucault. The print is too small. Right? They're, they're like trying to read this stuff on their phone, so you may have to help them understand that. Right? And that's also why they're looking for video, because their phone actually works better for video than for print. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not excusing their behavior. I'm just saying you're going to have to think a bit more about how to get them from what matters to them to what matters to you. All right. Um, so another place I use technology is I, use, I do online exams before every class. Right? Your Canvas will do this, your learning management system. It's a way to get students to say, just five easy questions. It'll take you five minutes, a couple of multiple choice questions. I want to make sure you did the reading. I want to make sure you understood the reading. I want to know what you didn't understand. So in fact, I do this more for me, because then I get feedback before class. So my exams are due an hour before every class. All right? And I won't give you one. Uh, that's fun, but I'll, I'm going to skip that example. Um, so this is what we know about the science of learning in the last couple of years. And this is a great book, this Make It Stick book. Um, this is my summary of a 300-page book, so you don't have to read it. Um, no, you should read it. Um, knowledge matters. It has to be concrete, right? It's what matters to me is what you learn. Think about that. You don't learn what the teacher says to learn. You learn what matters to you, what seems relevant to you. Knowledge is necessary but not sufficient. We knew that. Retrieval and testing turn out to be really important. That's actually how you learn. So tests are not bad. The problem is the stakes are bad. It's like the Olympics, right? If you're a swimmer and you like swimming or you like playing the piano, right? If you like, are the Olympics going to enhance your performance? Maybe not because you're going to get nervous and all freaked out, right? It's Carnegie Hall, probably not your best performance, right? So it's the stakes in exams that are the problem. But taking tests every day is actually really good for learning. I talked a lot about elaboration, making connections, right? We know this is how the brain works. Abstracting, larger context, right? That video assignment. Failure is key for learning, right? You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes, that's true. And interleaving, which is a weird thing, which turns out your brain actually works better when you don't do, you don't sit in the same place in the library every day. I know it worked for you, you're weird, right? You learned in spite of it, but it turns out changing the direction of your chair and sitting in a different place actually improves learning. Who knew, right? That's just science. This is design process. So this is how I think about the design process. This is what the new book, Teaching Naked Techniques, is about. It's really more about the practical. So faculty, we all start in the middle. Right? We start with content. What do I want you to know? Students start on the outside. They start with motivation. Why am I here? Do I care? Does this information matter at all? And my favorite example, so I call this the entry point. Right? We don't spend nearly enough time doing this. What's the entry point? So imagine that I'm going to, I've asked you to do an eight hour mandatory training for the Chicago Police Department on racial profiling. I'll give you as many PhDs as you want. You're the expert, you've written a million books. Is that going to help? Mandatory eight hour training for the Chicago Police Department on racial profiling. Where do you start? Where do you start? What's the first thing you want to do with this group? Ideas? What do you want to do? What do you want to do with this group? What do I have to do? Just going to tell them information and they'll write it down. It'll be OK. They'll learn a lot. What are they going to do? Yeah. Give me an idea. Get some context and history from the department. Context and history from the department. So what, what's, what's the, been their history? Good. What else? What's the first thing you want to do? Someone in the front. You're sitting in the front. Get them invested in yeah. you know, finding out what can be done, if anything. Your, your real job is to, is to get them to care about your subject because they don't care. It's like driver training class, right? You got a ticket and you have to go to class. That's called a tough audience, right? What you have is not a tough audience compared to this, right? So the place that you have to start is how do I motivate these students to think my subject is... So the other thing you have to do is you have to reduce, you have to reduce tension because they're all afraid you're going to tell me I'm bad 
And what do you do if I say, I'm going to tell you your, ba-, right, your, your fight or flight, your amygdala gets worked up, right? Your brain says, threat, threat response, which of course is something you actually want to talk about, right? Threat response shuts down your judgment. You're now afraid of what's going to happen. And so you don't go, leopard has beautiful spots. You just run. That's biology. So my suggestion for you is to don't start with your subject all the time, right? When I teach Wagner's Ring, I don't write Gesamtkunstwerk on the chalkboard and underline it. I start with, who likes music? Because it's a safe topic. So where do I start with my police department? Anybody here drive a truck? What kind of truck? You drive a Chevy, Dodge, Ford? How about you? Anybody else? Why do you drive that? Would you, would you trade with him? He drives a Ford. You wouldn't. You like Dodge? How come? Daddy drove a Dodge. You've been driving Dodge in your family for 30 years, huh? Huh. You have a bias toward Dodge? Right? Notice I didn't start, and actually I wouldn't go that fast. I let them talk about trucks for 20 minutes because I want the students to be engaged and think this is relevant and fun and interesting and exciting. And then to themselves come to the conclusion, wow, my, my preference for Dodge there's something here, right? So you want to, I want to gradually pull. I don't want to start with what matters to me. I've got to start by getting them to not be so afraid. Right? So that motivation first exposure bit is really important, and we tend not to do it. But then you have recall, elaboration, complication. Right? I want the complication bit to happen in class. And then the reflection bit, which I've talked about a little bit. I have what I call a cognitive wrapper. So my other advice to you, never put a grade on anything you hand to a student, ever. Technology has given you a perfect tool. Canvas, your learning management system, put it on there and say, hey, I've given you grades for your papers, but I've hidden them. Yes. Here is your paper with feedback. Read the feedback. Because what happens if you give them a grade? They look at the grade, they say, <gasps> amygdala, emotion. So let them read the feedback and don't let them, don't do it at the end of class. They just stuff it into their backpack and walk away. So we've got 15 minutes left in class. I'm giving you back your papers, your midterm, the opera audition results, whatever it is. Read the feedback. And now you estimate what you think your grade is. Where do you think you could have improved? How would you study differently next time? It's called a cognitive wrapper. And then, thank you very much, write a little note to yourself for the next paper on how you would do it differently. And then 15 minutes from now, the grades will be revealed. So that reflection bit, that self-learning bit, is really, really important. All right, last thing. So, okay, I, I talk too much. Um, so all I can do is show you pictures now. All right. These are naked classrooms. Looks kind of like a seminar room to me. Um, so you can't always teach in this small a group. This is at Emory, but you know glass is apparently the new wall. Um, so this is a classroom that was a 100-seater that was set up like most business classrooms with the, you know, the fixed seating. Notice we've changed that we put little rubber stoppers in here so that the kids don't launch themselves off the thing, but they're, but they're wheels, so you can turn around. I don't quite understand why Americans need two cup holders on every chair, but there you go. Um, I call this thing the e-nook. I took all the computers out of all the classrooms, right? My faculty call this the diaper changing station. Right, it's attached to the wall, so it means if you want to project or something, you bring a computer, you bring an iPad, you project, but there's no podium. This saves lots of money. Um, but it also kind of sends a different kind of message that class is not all about your presentation. Um, this is another room, right, no front here. Again, the node chairs. You can write on the wall. That's a, that's a total, that's the white paint. There's projection screens. There's also these guys over here, which are, which are you can take to your group. So they're, they're big hanging pads, and so you take them to your group and you can write on them. Um, this is a chemistry 100-seat classroom, Chemistry 101 from University of Maryland. You'll notice there's no front. There are students in groups of four. Each has a whiteboard and a computer. Each group of four, you rotate positions over the course of the semester. They teach 101 and 102 chemistry in this classroom to 100 students. They doubled retention by getting rid of the lectures. Right, students are now twice as likely to persist into 102 because they were active the whole time. And again, there's still the content, but it happens outside of the classroom, so no more lectures. This is a weird discussion room. Um, this is a room that has the two circles. So a typical discussion technique is those sitting on the inside can talk. Those sitting on the outside here are going to evaluate. So what was the comment? Because students don't know why you're doing discussion. What comment opened up a new line of inquiry? What comment made you think about the material in a different way? So I give the outside group an assignment, and then the inside group does the discussion, and they get then they switch. Right, so that's another kind of different, weird classroom. 
So new technology is here. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. I'm not going back to the dial, or dial phone. The good news is that thinking just became more important. That's what you really do. The bad news is course design just became more important, right? It's not about how much content you're professing, but can you design a system and a nudges and get the students to actually want to do the work themselves? Because the only way to learn is to do the work. That's why you're here. You were good at doing the work. And lastly, integration has become more important. Does the student life and who you room with and what, what the city is like, all of that actually adds all the value, because otherwise you just do the whole thing online. If all you're doing is delivering content, I can do it more efficiently online. But we bring people together to maximize all of the interactions that happen on a campus. So your student protests, your athletics, all of that actually turns out to matter more now in this new age of technology. So my advice is that to think about teaching as change and to remember that students are mostly in your classrooms because you are a superhero. You are an intellectual superhero. That's why you get to wear the cape every year, right? And it's true. Students are here because they admire you. They like to watch the way you think. They've never seen anybody change his or her mind in the public sphere before, for many of them. So if you really want to blow their minds, say, hey, thank you. That's a great question. It's a great comment. You may have changed my mind. That's probably the most powerful thing you can ever do, is to say, you, as a student, just changed my mind. But you're also modeling for students. That's what smart people do. They say, you know what? I said that, that there was a wiretap, but you know, I got it wrong. <laughs> That's what smart people do. They say, I have new information now. I should have looked at that more closely. I've had to reconsider. That's what smart people do. They reconsider, and they change their minds. Change is what smart people do, and you are the superheroes who do it. What you do is incredibly hard because it's not just about content. If it was only about knowing more than your students, you all win, get a promotion, great. But what you do is harder because you're trying to get people to change for themselves, not to think what you think, right? I'm a musician, so the goal is not to have all of my little piano students sound like me. My goal is to have all of my piano students sound like them, each individually. That's a lot harder. I can get them all to sound like me, that's easy, right? I want you all to think like me, I want you to think like you. And that's hard. So for what you do, I thank you and I applaud you because what you do is the hardest job and it is also the most essential job for democracy and it's essential right now. So thank you very much. Questions? Okay, so we started a little late. I talked too long. Which of those surprises you? <laughs> um, are there any, I have a few minutes for questions if you want a question or if you want to just throw stuff at me, it's okay. okay. Um, what do you do with students who don't know the technology that you're using in the class? Like, do you spend time teaching them and how do you do that? So this is a great question. Um, so students, there's a huge digital divide in our country. Some students have access, some students don't. Um, most students do have a phone. That's actually the phone is the more ubiquitous than the laptop. My advice is to make sure everybody has a laptop. So either require the laptop or have loaner laptops or something um, and have, the, have it all be the same so the technology is seamless. But there, there is some work to be done to make sure you have a level playing field. Because the problem is if you don't, it's not fair, right? Two to three percent of students in America apply to college on their phone. Cool, huh? No. That's not cool, that's not a fair fight. So you had tutors, you used a laptop, you wrote your essay, your parents helped you, and you wrote your college essay with your thumbs on your phone. That's just not fair, but you did it because it's the only device you had. You didn't have access to a computer. So in my view, you've gotta level the playing field. So that either means computers for everybody or computers for nobody, which is hard because they're attached to it, right? It's like saying, when you say, please close your laptop, it's like saying, please cut off a finger, right? So, so having some structure in place to help students do that. I find that for the video assignment, when I started doing it five years ago, I said, here's how to make a video. So I made a video about how to load a video to YouTube. I actually had a student do it. And then I realized I didn't need to do that anymore. I could just say, does anybody not know how to put a video on YouTube? Great. Put a video, put a two minute video on YouTube and then label it in the comments with my course hashtag, right? That's all I had to do. So, you know, but, but make a video for how to use the technology, have students help other students and set that up, but that's, 
Stuff like making a video they'll know how to do. Other stuff they may not, like how to do a wiki. I mean, so you're gonna have a wide range, but, but that's where you need your help of your support and your technology people. I know they wanna do that to help you. Okay, there's a, there's a question back here. Do you have a question? Yes, no. You're all ready for cookies. <laughs> Nothing? Nobody's gonna throw rocks at me? I just changed your title after three, after you know, 600 years of being a professor, you now all wanna be cognitive coaches? No? Going once. There we are. Okay, someone's going to save us. I was typing while you were talking, <laughs> which happens. You mentioned there was something about introducing reading. Uh, how can you go back over that again? I missed. Sure. I know, I know. So I talked about introducing reading on social media. And the reason I do this is because the reason for the reading is usually opaque to students. Students like, you've assigned me chapter four of this textbook, or you want me to read this dead white guy, you know why? I don't get it. So, so make that reason obvious, but, my, but do it when they're going to do this. That means Tuesday night, Thursday night, Sunday afternoon. And so Twitter will make you, force you to be short. Facebook will short, you know, you could be longer there. But, I, but those are good places to say, hey, just a reminder, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. Here are three reasons why Rousseau still matters. Or here's one reason, right, because Twitter doesn't give you that much. Here's one reason and a little bit of incentive. So, so a lot of us put this in our last bit of our lecture. We put it in the syllabus, and so that's okay too. But my suggestion is that, that since that first contact matters, if you can relieve stress, because they've probably gone, right, you relieve stress on Thursday afternoon. Hey, we're gonna read Rousseau next week. It's really fun. I think you're gonna like it. It's great. By Sunday, they've forgotten that. So on Sunday, I pre-program, because I'm asleep on Sunday, right? So on Thursday, I, after class, I create my little Twitter, and then I post it, and so it goes out on Sunday. Hey, remember, Rousseau is really going to be fun. Yeah, I know, he's a dead white guy. But you're really going to be excited by this idea of virtue. And it seems like it makes no difference at all. But virtue, right? whoever talks about virtue, Rousseau is talking about virtue. Why? That's enough, right? Just a little, and again, it's not going to work for everybody. But it's disproportionately going to work for first-generation students who are like, who's Rousseau? My first day of college, true story. I'm sitting on my first day of college, and I went to my class, I went to History 101 with Cricket, because I never met anybody named Cricket. I went to public school with 650 kids. Teacher says, this week, we're gonna be discovering the three A's. Three A's? Who the hell are they? Right? So, Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas. So I turn to Cricket and go, Cricket, I never heard of those guys. Who are those guys? Are they dead? Are they a new band? She says, ah, I read them all in high school, don't bother. I'm done, right? I am totally like college, not for me, wrong university. I am just done. That, that my threat response is going like crazy. So if, if somebody said to me, well, here's why we're reading Aristotle, and yeah, he's a dead guy, and here's what it is, and, right? So again, not everybody needs that, but for a first-generation student, I am panicked right now. And so I, the point is you can make these changes with a little tiny bit, it doesn't, it's not a lot. It's just a little bit of de-escalate the threat this is not gonna be so scary. I'm gonna be here to help you, right? Because learning happens mostly when you have high standards and nurturing support. One or the other, one by itself, doesn't work. You have to have both. The standards are high. You are all gonna read Aristotle this semester, and it's gonna be hard. Tell them it's gonna be hard. But you'll be able to do it because I believe in you and I'm gonna help you. And those of you who think this is too hard, that's okay, I'm gonna be here for you. I'll be on Facebook for you, right? That that combination turns out to really, really work. All right, thank you very much. Let's have some cookies.